is the industry's first web protection platform that works in any cloud, any container, any platform as a service, and any modern application architecture. The Signal Sciences web protection platform can be deployed in next generation WAF, RASP, or reverse proxy modes, giving customers ultimate flexibility and coverage. Protect your web applications with Signal Sciences web protection platform. Signal Sciences, protecting applications, connecting teams. For more information, check them out at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Layered Insight is the industry's first embedded security approach for containers. Trusted by Global 1000 Enterprises to secure their containerized applications, it's the only solution that requires no root privileges, has zero dependency on the underlying infrastructure, and is fully portable across any container environment. Unified DevOps and SecOps, enabling the rapid development of containerized applications without worrying about security. To learn more, please visit layeredinsight.com forward slash ASW. Welcome back, everyone, to Application Security Weekly. Paul, speaking of WordPress, did yeah. you hear about the latest update to destroy updates? Uh, I did now. <laughs> uh, so and what ended up happening is earlier this week, uh, basically what ended up happening is they released uh, 4.9.3 as a maintenance release. It wasn't uh, wasn't related to security, you know. Just had some bug fixes, so cool. Like where people patch, right? Like it auto updates. Well, for more than four years, they've been doing auto updates, pretty much no problem. And uh, what happened in four point nine point three is it broke auto update functionality. It did, I, I'm speaking, but the, it's all expletives, so they're just muting my, my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well can you imagine though like so you run wordpress right you uh it auto updates and you think everything is fine do you think that like enough people are actually going to well, go hold fix on this because Let's back they, might, up. they probably don't even know that's back up if you run wordpress you should never ever 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 think that everything is fine just throwing that out there <laughs> <laughs> that's table stakes for that's running wordpress okay that's probably secondly true. That's breaking probably true. auto updates is that really sucks. That really sucks. Well, for those of us that well, run let's WordPress, think about it, right? so so to that end, uh, what ends up happening is those people that run WordPress uh, are used to for the last four years now auto updates happening, mm -hmm. and unless you have really really good information that gets pushed out to everyone, not just like a website that's up there that you have to go and consume, but like mass messaging. Your shit is broken. Sorry, you need to actually patch this and fix this because otherwise you're going to be vulnerable later. There's going Keith, to be so many more vulnerable websites as a result of this. My question is, have you played with WP Engine before? Uh, Are you still there? So, uh, you know, honestly, I... Go ahead, sorry. I was going to say, I haven't as of yet, but tell me more. So I don't know a whole lot about it and I'm surprised that I haven't researched it having uh, WordPress. I actually have... Uh, well, four essentially WordPress instances, right? That run two sites. So I've got a dev copy and a production copy. WP Engine helps you sync all of those copies and, and replicate across those multiple copies. Uh, it kind of sounded similar to like how you would deploy in a containerized environment, except except it's very specific to WordPress. Uh, and that's really the model that I want to go to. I don't want to rely on the plugin updating process and the WordPress updating process in production, I want to move to a more DevOps style environment where I'm building and testing all of that in my dev and QA environment and then pushing out to production the final release. I don't want to have to do the updates for plugins or the WordPress engine or anything else, even updates to my theme, which is very important for security as well. Uh, I don't want to do those in production. I want to do those in uh, dev and QA, and then I just want to I want to push a new container or a new WordPress image out into production, uh, and that's the model that I will eventually adopt. Uh, I don't see a lot of documentation on how to do that inside of Docker, largely because I think most people that are using that model are using WP Engine. Although I haven't really looked at exactly how WP Engine works, so it's my bad. I'm still learning. What I learn, I will share with our listeners. I feel embarrassed that I haven't looked more into WP Engine uh, over the years. So, what you could probably do, honestly, if you're doing some sort of like containerization build, is you can probably use curl scripts and, and other things to let WP Engine do all the replication and do all the kind of the updating. 
and then you have maybe a curl script that will run that will dockerize it'll run like the the docker build process for you uh, mm-hmm. through a bash script and it'll just put it all inside of the the docker container as a wordpress uh, like you know import from wordpress or from wordpress right whatever because they actually i believe have a docker container already I gotcha. and then you can just you know move everything in definitely uh I'll, i'm going to pull into some design meetings when we get to that <laughs> i think i just signed myself up for some more work sounds you did. good you did. uh so any other, uh, so from the bugs, breaches, and more section, Paul, uh, which is where the story number three WordPress was from, are there any other stories in there that you wanted to cover? I know we're somewhat limited on time this week before we jump to the other section. No, I'm good. Let's jump into the other sections. Sure, oh, sure. So, especially the uh, iPhone my... source code. So we talked about this last night. I want to get your, your thoughts on this because I didn't read uh, as much as I would have liked on this particular story. But if the bootloader source code iOS based devices has been leaked. Does that mean I can run Android on my iPhone now? <laughs> Possibly, if you think about it, right? So you'd you'd have to somehow jailbreak that process. And I I guarantee you you wouldn't want to do it. And the reason you wouldn't want to do it is probably because the architecture inside of the iPhone is going to break in all sorts of really, really bad ways. Yeah, you, uh, then Android you have to port Android running. to that hardware platform, of course. But right. Right. Anytime you have a, a access to potentially uncover a bug in a bootloader, it really means you can then have the flexibility to load whatever firmware you want on that device, provided you've got firmware that can actually work on that device. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so um, what was really interesting for those that don't know what happened, uh, basically the iBoot software, which is the critical iOS program that helps your phone boot up, so that Apple logo you see as you boot your phone, for example, uh, that's part of the iBoot process, and it's a secure process intended to uh, prevent the circumvention of things like, you know, logging in with a password or uh, all sorts of other things. And so that code was anonymously posted to GitHub, and it was quickly removed. Apple uh, had a you know copyright takedown request, and GitHub complied with it accordingly. But I guarantee you, there's probably a good number of people that cloned that code locally before that got pulled down. Mm. And so. Uh, experts basically are saying that that source code as a core component of iPhone's operating system on GitHub uh, would pave the way for hackers to be able to actually do things like iPhone jailbreaks, which, by the way, I, I, um, I posted up a link in the, uh, the notes that I sent to you, all, which is a link to the prices for current day like phone exploits. An iOS remote jailbreak on uh, things like, I don't know, Zerodium or or other markets that are purchasing these vulnerabilities for maybe sales to governments, $2 million wow. is how much that kind of exploit is worth today. So I guarantee you there's probably some uh, some really good companies like Azimuth Security, for example, who have probably pulled down that code and they are pouring over it. By the way, I also heard, and, and this is going to enrage developers more than anything, they mixed tabs and spaces in that code, Paul. Oh that is my like the God, that's <laughs> blasphemy. I'm disgusted right now. Indeed. I just threw up in my <laughs> mouth a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, as a, as a Python developer like you, Paul, uh, for me, I was just like, are you kidding me? They mix tabs and spaces. Like, if, it, if this was written in Python, it would never, like, it'd never run. Uh, but, yeah, so needless to say, a, developers they, you should know be what? outraged. I'm just going to send uh, an anonymous package to Apple with the Code Complete uh, programming book. Have you ever read Code Complete? I have. I have. <laughs> It was a Microsoft uh, engineer that wrote that wrote that book. Uh, and, it, yeah. and he's updated. Which would be actually, kind of ironic. I want to buy an updated copy of that. I haven't read it in, in some time. When I was learning how to code uh, while I was intern uh, working part time in, in college, uh, one of my mentors that was teaching me how to program recommended that book, and uh, it, he would like physically hit me if I mixed tabs and spaces. So, uh, yeah, clearly. <laughs> That's a good way to learn. It uh, is. Carrot and stick, uh, you know, give them it the is. book and then hit them with it. It's like old school kung fu training is how I learned how to how to program. <laughs> it's how you learn security too. It's kind of a it's a good good process. And so, uh, needless to say, I think they need also that book, Clean Code, uh, excellent book. If you've never read it, Paul, I'll mm. send you a copy. It's really really good. We um, you know, it's been suggested also- uh, that we create a book club for Security Weekly. On Business Security Weekly, we talk about business books. Now we've just started talking about uh, books for application uh, development and security. So it, it clearly we're going to need some kind of, I, I don't want it to be too formal, but uh, book recommendations I think are good. 
Oh, for sure, for sure. And in fact, uh, I, I should mention that in this week's uh, Learning and Tools, Rapid7 is launching a threat intelligence book club, by the way. So go ahead mm. and go to wiki.securityweekly.com and check that out. Nice. What else we got? Uh, so I was going to say, I know we're a little bit pressed on time. So uh, I want to go to story number four on the if you build it, they will come. So Facebook is effectively using the tried and true method of blacklisting to prevent uh, Bitcoin advertisements taking place on their platform. And uh, Matt Swish, uh, founder and cybersecurity startup Comey Technologies, was basically saying, look, they are bypassing the filters by using, uh, you know, zeros instead of O's and sevens instead of T's. And suddenly they're advertising Bitcoin again. And Come so, on, Facebook, blacklisting doesn't work. Well, well and so that's a great point, Keith. And, and really what I want to talk about in this story um, is, all right, so this story starts with, um, uh, I had a dream. Right. And it was more like a nightmare uh -oh. that Jim Carrey hacked my Facebook account. And it, it was, a, yeah, it was a very real dream. And I, to this day, I'm still mad at Jim Carrey for hacking my Facebook account, even though it was just in my own head. Uh, but he embarrassed me on Facebook in front of all my security friends by hacking my Facebook account. And I was, I was very, very disturbed. I'm still to this day, very disturbed by that. What's interesting in real life Jim Carrey has come out recently, um, removed his Facebook account, and is selling his stock or something in, in Facebook, I believe as well, and encouraging others to leave Facebook, essentially stating that Facebook somehow uh, collaborated with uh, the Russian hackers that were trying to influence the election by taking out Facebook ads. And what I was explaining, actually this to my, to my wife, because uh, we might have heard it like on the, the radio or the news, is I'm like, it's not like Facebook sat down with the Russian hackers and was like, let's make a deal. And the Russians like, yes, we drink vodka uh, and, and make a deal. <laughs> uh, I'm like, it's totally just like a hacking thing. Like your story here, they're trying to bypass filters. Like anyone can take out a Facebook ad and there are certain rules and restrictions that Facebook is automatically trying to put into place. Very similar to how I believe Google loses the battle on the YouTube front uh, with illicit content on YouTube and also ad abuse uh, on the YouTube platform as well, they've got a very, very severe application security problem in trying to enforce these rules about two things, content in, in and of itself and taking out ads uh, and preventing malicious things from happening. And you often see that in terms of limitations. You can't put URLs in a lot of places on YouTube and uh, Facebook for, well, YouTube more uh, appropriately, right? because it'll be such an, uh, something that's abused. But I feel like it's a cat and mouse game. I almost feel like we're always losing. And it kind of ties back to my, my Jim Carrey story as well, which I think is just ridiculous. So honestly, it's interesting because this is an architectural problem at scale, right? You are monetizing through advertisements. So you want more advertisements to be purchased. So you don't right. want to be too restrictive on how those advertisements are coming through. But you now are facing a threat model as a result of having those advertisements in place uh potentially because i can buy mis misuse and abuse i can buy more reach the more money i spend the more people i can reach whereas if i just set up a facebook page or a youtube account getting people there is harder than if i were to just pay if i get facebook a, you know a few thousand dollars i can reach tens of thousands of maybe a hundred thousand people with my advertisement and hope people click on it now a legitimate business purpose you see actually a lot of startups, a lot of them outside of technology, using that very effectively to promote their products. However, you see bad guys, like in the case of this story, um, that are advertising malicious things. And how do, you, how do you make that balance? That is a very difficult application security problem, in my opinion. And you're for right, sure, blacklisting sure. is and not I the imagine, approach. I was going to say, I imagine that as um, artificial intelligence and machine learning gets adopted by some of these really large organizations who are pushing the envelope in that space, right? They're really yeah. innovating there. Uh, we will see some very interesting outcomes as a result of the work that they do. Uh, I know that we're very limited on time. I wanted to quickly just uh, say that Microsoft has open sourced a new Kubernetes GPU and device scheduling extension. So if you are into Kubernetes, check that out. But Paul, I wanted to end, because I wear glasses personally, I wanted to end on the story number four on the Food for Thought section, which is Intel has made smart glasses that actually look normal. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if you got a chance to look at the article at all, uh, but it's got, a, it's got a nice video in it. And uh, 
you know how people are kind of wearing the thick rim glasses, like the chunky glasses now, the, the new style. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at the, the picture of those style. glasses. I have gunners, uh, a couple of pair of gunners that are similar uh, frame. Right, right. And so what's interesting here, though, is there's no camera. There's no button to push, no gesture or swiping, no glowing LCD screen or any sort of thing like that. What it actually does is it projects a very um, low frequency, low emitting laser into your retina. Nice. So it actually has, uh, you have to get measured for these when they make the frame, but it has a kind of a, a, a laser on the side of the frame that is at such an angle that when you wear your glasses, it projects on, onto your retina. Hmm. And so there's, you never, no one else would ever see that you're actually, you know, like maybe unless you blink, that you actually have these kind of smart glasses. And uh, so Intel is actually basically saying, look, we can build smart glasses that can do things like give you notifications or heads up displays in a way that is non-invasive to others around you, as in the case with Google Glass and the camera that was on it. Uh, and we can do it without the additional kind of like battery packs that you might need to carry around or, you know, it's effectively a wireless technology, similar to like the earbuds where or uh, uh, ear pods or whatever they're called. Air, um, AirPods. AirPod. AirPods. Um, so. To that end, it's it's like uh, they're taking this whole idea and they're like, cool, rather than giving you like an LCD screen on your glasses, which can be intrusive, you can just project onto your eye. And if you look straight ahead, you won't see it. But if you look down, the projection actually ends up in your retina in such a way that you can actually see the image. Uh, so if you're interested in smart technologies and you're a listener, uh, go check out that article. It's uh, number four on the Food for Thought section. The last thing I want is notifications coming up on my glasses for social media. Uh, There's got to be better uh, use cases for that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think for me it'll be driving. Uh, that would be really cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. If they can project like another screen onto my eye so I can have another screen of code, like I can have three monitors and like a fourth in my eye, that'd be cool. There you then, go. I don't right, know if well, it necessarily so I... will work, work that way to write code while looking at, in my glasses, but yeah. Right, right. Well, so you have to like you're looking, you're looking at your screen, and you have to look through your glasses to actually write. Right? Right. Maybe it's it's telling you what code to write next. Maybe you're actually like looking up from uh, Stack Overflow. Yeah, I just need Stack actually, Overflow like, coming there, up so. in my in my glasses while I write code. That'd be awesome. That's a good use case. Or, or terrible. I or mean, terrible I don't know which, use case. But I think at this point, <laughs> right, right. It so depends. You roll the dice. You roll up. the dice when you copy and paste from Stack Overflow, of course. Indeed, indeed. Um, so yeah, uh, in this case, I just want to say thank everyone for joining us this week again for another episode of Application Security Weekly. Remember to get commit and stay classy.